start with data visualizations of historical importance. And I think this is, I always include this in my lectures because in my workshops, because A, I think it's very interesting and B, I think it's important to understand how powerful data visualizations have been throughout history. And some of these you may be very familiar with if you're a data viz uh, person or a healthcare person, epidemiologist, statistician. So for example, John Snow, MD, who has been recognized for taking the data and information about the cholera outbreak um, outside of London and Soho uh, in the late 1700s. And when no one would pay attention to what was in the data and his theory that it wasn't that cholera was passed through the air, the miasma theory, but rather it had something to do with a contaminated water supply. Um, the way that he and his colleagues eventually were able to really grab the town elders uh, attention was by taking all the data and information that were in tables and buried and starting to plat plot them on this uh, map that showed where people traveled, where people got their water, and where he believed the contaminated well uh, was. So as the story goes, uh, he also had outliers. So there were some people who uh, should have died according to their predictive model, and they did have a predictive model about expected mortalities, um, that they found didn't die. And when they dove into the data and information and they talked to folks, what they learned was that those folks didn't drink any of the water at, at all. They all worked at the brew house and they got their, they drank beer all the time. So the joke is, you know, saved by the beer. And there were other outliers that they were able to explain. But the bottom line about this very famous story in history, and that is in a great book that I would recommend to you called The Ghost Map, is that once the data was taken out of these tables and put onto a map where people could see patterns and potential relationships between the water supply um, and the deaths, that's when they were able to stem the tide of cholera. So the famous story is take the handle off the pump, people can't get their water there anymore, and they see mortalities decrease. Um, so that's Jon Snow. Um, often I think overlooked some uh, what in the literature is also the contribution of Florence Nightingale. So we all think about her as the lady with the lamp. But in fact, what Florence also was, was a statistician. And like Jon Snow, she captured lots of data and information in tables about the deaths due uh, during the Crimean War. And if you read her uh, biography, she's purported to have said, if I were to show these facts and figures to Queen Victoria, her eyes would glaze over. Um, and so what Florence created, and she uh, has been cited as creating one of the most 100 uh, influ most influential data visualizations uh, ever, top 100, is the Batwing or the Coxcomb map. And essentially what Florence did was she again saw in her data that soldiers weren't dying from their battle wounds, but rather they were dying when they were bring, being brought into hospitals where the sanitation was non-existent. You know, horrible water, dead animal carcasses in the water, no infection control whatsoever. Um, and so what Florence did was she plotted over time the causes of death. And the real takeaway here is that the blue are those uh, infections and deaths that occurred once these soldiers were brought into these horrible conditions of the hospitals. And then as they were able to improve um, the conditions, how these all started to uh, decline. And so that's Florence Nightingale. And again, that's in the late 1700s. And the idea is once people can see what we always like to talk about, see the story or the opportunity in the data, that's when you can move people to take action. Um, Jack Wenberg uh, here in the United States uh, has established the Dartmouth Atlas project about maybe 25, 30 years ago now. And long story short, Jack Winberg did a lot of work with health claims, uh, insurance claims in the United States for the Medicare program, which uh, insures a specific cohort of patients in the United States. And what they were seeing was lots of variation in care that was not able to be explained 
through the data even after it was risk adjusted. And like John Snow and Florence Nightingale, Wenberg and his team published the information in lots of scientific and research journals with lots of tables, but it wasn't resonating. It wasn't until they had the idea of mapping the information on these core Pleth maps, which is just a fancy word for where a rate of something is darker, a uh, higher, you could use a darker color and lower, a uh, lighter color. But it's when they started to create these maps that people started to say, what is going on? Why is it that in some parts of the com country we see more people, you know, getting end of life care for cancer in the hospital at a greater extent than in other parts of the country when we hold steady and risk adjust for everything? And what's important about Wenberg's work is that it didn't provide an answer. Rather, it provided a question and a problem that needed to be solved. Wenberg's been named one of the um, most influential health services researcher of um, uh, all time. And his work has really changed not only how we think about health and healthcare delivery in the United States, but it's really gone worldwide and people often reference his work. And I would encourage you to look up the Dartmouth Atlas because there's a ton of great data and data visualizations out there. So that's just sort of a few seminal folks who have used data visualization over time to get the data that's buried up and in front of people's eyes so that they can see the opportunities. So what is the foundation of great uh, health and healthcare data displays? And I always want to remind people of this. Technology alone is absolutely not the solution. Just because you have Microsoft Word, which we all do, doesn't mean that you can write the great American novel. So just because you have Tableau or Excel or Python or Click or you know, Power BI, it, it doesn't matter. If you don't know the fundamentals of data analysis, uh, data visualization, et cetera, this technology is not gonna help you, right? Um, as a matter of fact, it's just gonna probably help you create something that's indecipherable. So we love the technology, but that is not the solution alone. And so what I wanna to talk to you today about is what does it really take to create great visits, whether you're in healthcare or any other uh, uh, sector, but really I think healthcare is unique because of the expertise it takes in the different domains. So what do I mean by that? It really takes a team. And I'm not going to talk today about ways to uh, use methodologies to get it requirements, etc. A lot of that's in the book. And there are a lot of that's out there um, that you can find. But I really want you to understand that it does take a team. And it takes a team who understands health and healthcare and definitely statistics. On the far right, we need technology. There's no two ways about it, but it's not the only, uh, it's not the total solution. And then in the middle, the thing that we're gonna talk about today is data visualization and design thinking. And this is the emerging space. But we have to put groups of people together who appreciate which each one bring to the table. And we have to be able to uh, use methods to draw out of one another what it is that we're trying to achieve and how to achieve and again, each one of these clearly is a whole topic into it, unto itself, but we're going to stick right here um, this morning. So the other thing that I want folks to always know about data visualization, which many of you may know, but it's worth repeating, is that, you know, data visualization is not intuitive. It's not something you're born knowing how to do. Um, it's not that one person is more creative than another person. Creativity absolutely helps, but it's not about that. It's really about understanding human cognition and how our eyes translate information into our brains, what our brains do with it, and then using all of that to create really great visualizations. And if you don't understand and you're not a student of the research that informs the best practices, you're going to make mistakes and you're going to miss things. 
And of course, there are a lot of researchers out there. I just put up Colin Ware because he's one of the lead researchers and he's written a lot of the textbooks and we use them all and study them all. He has a new one out actually uh, recently. But you can see that what he writes about and talks about is information visualization perception for design. And this is based on the research of how humans see and understand data and information. So what have we learned from some of this research? Um, well, we know that 70% of the way uh, humans take in all data and information is through their eyes. And we always hear people say, well, I'm a visual learner. Right, we all are. We take in so much of our world through our eyes. But our brain is really selective and we only process about 5% of what we see in our vision because if we took in everything that was in our line of vision, our brains would just be on overload. We simply couldn't do it, right? So we're very selective about what it is that we see and comprehend. And so if you're throwing everything at somebody and saying, hey, look at all of this, you're really overloading them um, and you're not it, leveraging that 5%, you're not using the techniques to leverage that 5% to say, I really want you to look at this thing. And so that's one of the things that we have to remember about all of this. And I'm going to talk more about that. And some folks will say, well, I know that there's a lot of noise out there in the world, right? And I know that attention span has really uh, gone down, which is true. Microsoft did a research study where they uh, said that in 2000, our human attention span was 12 seconds. Um, and now in 2013, which is seven years ago, it was only eight seconds, which is a second less than a goldfish. And so this idea is, you know, some people will say, well, we're gonna throw every fancy thing that we can think in every color in the world because, you know, we know that we've got to grab people's attention. Then if we grab it, they'll come in and they'll look at our data and they'll study it and they'll figure it out. Wrong, they won't. You get eight seconds, and so it needs to be clear, simple, precise, leverage that 5%, um, and there are different ways uh, to do that. So this is what's called pre-attentive processing, and that means that that 5% in humans is wired to really select the most critical information. Stated very simply, we are wired to see what is different. So if we can't discern what is different, everything just sort of blow, you know, melds together, uh, blurs together, and we get tired and we move on very quickly. Like we get overload um, because we just have not been able to very quickly see what's important. And we've all had that experience like, whoa, too much. Not gonna take the time to try and figure this one out. So this is called pre-attentive processing. And there are really three ways that we can leverage people's pre-attentive processing um, in our data visualizations. One is through color, either the hue, right? A different color from everything else, or the intensity, a different saturation um, of one color. And that's part of what we do on choropleth maps. We can make something a different size, hey, that circle is bigger than every other circle or orientation, something's going in a different direction. We're familiar with this when we italicize something, for example, even in a sentence, right? We're saying, hey, this is important, this sentence. We can also use shapes um, and we pick out, oh, I see that the triangle um, is the different shape from the diamonds. We can use length, um, we can use width, and we can use where something is on the page. We can separate it from all the other data points that we want you to see. For example, here are the outliers in um, a scatter plot. But this is not just random. This is based on how we see and understand data and information in our world and leveraging pre-attentive processing. So for example, you know, we can see the lengths of the bar and we can comp we can easily compare um, the lengths to direct our attention. Or we can use color and we can say, these are the top five. You know, here's everything else, but look here. And these are very simple examples, but there's a reason why we do it. So we don't wanna do it randomly. We want to do it with purpose. Additionally, uh, you know, 
color. And in the healthcare space, we are notorious for using the red, yellow, green stoplight. Are you doing well or not doing well? But we know that about 10%, maybe eight to 10% of all people in the world are red, green, colorblind. That's the most common type of colorblind. So that's over 300 million people um, and more men than women. And so if you're colorblind, red, yellow, green, you know, you're not seeing those stoplight colors, you're just seeing that monochromatic sort of yellow uh, color. Um, so you're not able to discern what, what those colors are telling you. Um, and I've had with almost every single client, we find uh, that at least one person either knows someone who is this colorblind or is colorblind in this way. So how does that translate to something practical? So let's imagine that we're showing, you know, how you're doing on some different metrics of interest. So the bar is your performance and the line is some comparator. And so we want to say, well, you know, yes, we can see that you're doing better than the comparator here through the bar and not as well here on the second line, metric two. And then we think, well, we're going to make this even better by adding, you know, green and red dots. But in actual fact, if you're colorblind, you can't see those. So you just see a bunch of dots. In addition to the fact, what is this about? It's really about drawing your attention to the places where you need to improve something. So in the middle, we've just used um, we've just used the red points in different saturations of color to say, um, these are the ones that you need to pay attention to where you're not meeting the comparison or some target or some budget. Um, and we also can use saturation of these colors to say, this is your biggest opportunity. Um, and this is you know, an opportunity, but it's not as large as this one. Now you may say, well, I thought that colorblind people, red, green, can't see the red. And that's true, but they can see the different different saturations of these colors. And so by using this technique, we've taken care of the folks who can see the red, but we've also just by using a symbol and a saturation said, hey, you might want to look at this one and this one and this one. Here, it's all lost to our colorblind colleagues. Here, we're communicating, look here. That's pre-attentive processing again in action. All right. So we talk about four shapes that you can use alone or in combination to create really beautiful and powerful data visualizations. And people will say only four shapes, you know, there's a whole lot of other things out there, but I hope to persuade you that, uh, you know, these four shapes are really powerhouses. So we have bars oriented vertically or horizontally. We have lines, we have points, and we have boxes also oriented vertically or horizontally. And so in this section, I'm just gonna run you through different ways that you can use these shapes alone and in combination. And I'm also gonna show you some of the do's and don'ts. So, we know that we can use bars either horizontally or vertically. And oftentimes people will say to us, well, which way should I turn them? Um, and it doesn't matter. You can turn them either way. What matters is uh, who is your audience and do they need expanded labels or do they know the acronyms? Um, and what else might you be going to put on that follows this. So what do I mean by that? Over here on the right hand part of the screen, if my audience is not familiar with these acronyms, I can flip it this way and use my label space here um, to label the bar and I can make comparisons. If my audience is familiar and it makes the most sense to display these vertically, then I can use the acronyms. So part of it is just Think about your audience. How much do they know or don't they know? What else is going to be on the page? And I'll show you more of this, um, but they can go either way. The other thing about bars, however, in bar bas basics, no matter what anyone tells you, bars must start at zero. Full stop, no exceptions. If you're going to use a bar graph, they need to start at zero. And here's why. Um, when you're using a bar chart, you are encoding how big something is. Um, and so if you don't start at zero here on the right-hand part of this 
um, display, what you're doing is you're really exaggerating what are smaller differences than uh, you're showing if you cut off half of the values. And that's the reason why bar graphs must start at zero. Now, there are some techniques to use that I will show you if um, there's some reason why the zero start point isn't working for you. You have a large range of values or the endpoints, uh, the values are, are very close, but I'll show you those. But the bottom line is bar graphs must start at zero and there's a reason why. Um, of course, we can use histograms to show left skew, right skew, and normal distributions. But very often we see a mistake that folks mean make, and that's what we call the my bin or yours trap. So what do I mean by that? So you'll notice here that um, histograms show uh, different uh, intervals of data. Um, and you need to label them clearly. But if you look here in the confusing bin label at the bottom, you'll see that I am unclear about whether somebody who is 25 years old goes in that second bin or the third bin. And if somebody's 30 years old, they go in the third bin or the fourth bin. So you have to be really careful. And this is a mistake we see very, very often. So my bin or yours, make sure you get those binned correctly. The other thing that we see in healthcare data is often we have big groups of uh, age groups, especially where we say, well, if you're 85 years and older, right, we're just going to put you all together. We're not going to break you out in these other, you know, five or 10 year uh, intervals. And so one of the techniques you can use if this is something you need to draw folks attention to is um, a color to say, hey, this bin, um, this grouping is different, right? Um, we had to group them differently. But these are all the things that you just want to make sure folks are aware of. Of course, you can use bars for population pyramids, and we use these lots in public health, especially to see perhaps how demographics have changed or how people have moved. Um, and so all you're doing is showing directly, for example, males and female age distribution in the country of France in 2017. And you can see the shape and the distribution of both of them, but instead of putting them one after next, this is a nice way to see um, the shape. Um, we can also sort bars. That's what makes them really powerful. So we don't have to sort them. We can just show uh, nominal data in name only, categorical data, uh, unsorted. But bars are beautiful because we can just simply sort from low to high or high to low, depending on what's important in the data. Um, we can also use bars for trend. We often, most often use lines, but if it's important to see the actual data, um, we can use bars to show data over time. And this shows us, for example, you know, when does it look like flu tests are the highest versus when do they, you know, which way does this data, uh, what is the shape of this data? You can also use bars in to show time if you have really limited space, um, and you can show the most recent time frame at the top or at the bottom, depending on how your audience needs to see it. So although we often use lines, there are times when bars can work very well to show us time trend data. Um, we can also use bar to compare multiple data points. And, the mistake that we often make is that we um, maybe will do the following. So, if we, so, so for example, if we want to see about a percent of adults with a common chronic conditions by region, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, um, now we're using a bar graph for the different regions. And the challenge with this is pre-attentively, I've got to hold this in my um, color code in my uh, head and I've got to compare it across. Additionally, it's very hard for me to compare the first bar, Northeast diabetes, to Northeast, I mean, Northeast obesity, to Northeast diabetes, to Northeast East <laughs> hypertension, right? It's very hard to sort of go across. But using a technique you may be familiar with um, that was created by our guru, DataViz, um, Edward Tufte called small multiples. And what's beautiful about small multiples is it allows you, for example, to switch these um, 
and small multiples can be lots of things, but in this example, we're using these bars. I can just flip them horizontally. I can use my label once. I know that people read from left to right. And so I can easily see how the Southeast um, compares on these type three conditions. Additionally, each of these is a self-contained graph, so I can look up and down and see which region has the highest obesity rate. For example, um, it's Northeast and they have the highest hypertension. In small multiples, it's important that we keep our scale the same across the three graphs. Um, so that these bars are all proportional. But these are beautiful and these work beautifully on um, dashboards, for example, because they, they give you such a punch. But these are just simply bars and it's how you arrange them. And you'll also notice that we've gotten rid of the distracting colors and the keys, right? Now I just see the shape of the data, the values in the data, small multiples and bars. Um, we also have the problem of, you know, part to whole relationships, right? Um, so uh, sometimes we try to use stacked bar charts, um, multiple parts, and they just fall apart. And here's why. Two parts works very well because proportionally I can see how they break out and I can see where each part begins and ends on the scale. Um, and that's really important here. Three times may be okay if I have limited space, but more than three times, these things just simply don't work um, because you're beginning and ending each section after part two of the bar and a different place on the scale. So either you have to do mental gymnastics in your head to do arithmetic or um, uh, you have to stick labels in these. So all you've done is really created a color coded uh, table of different colors um, and shapes. So again, you can use these small multiples to flip these things on their side and lay them out one after next. So small multiples are fabulous. Um, so I mentioned that bar graphs must start at zero. And sometimes, however, you know, we just have small differences that we need to show, or sometimes we don't wanna show the actual difference because everybody has a different actual um, value. Um, we wanna show relative difference. And so deviation bar graphs are fantastic for that. So um, what do I mean by that? So let's pretend that we have budgets by department. Everybody has a different budget. And I'm just monitoring who's up or who's down. I don't need to know the actual dollar amount. I just want to know maybe who should I talk to first. I can lay my departments out here and I can just say what percentage are they over or under um, budget. Now, of course, the actual values uh, may tell a different story, but at a glance, I can just see who's doing what relative to uh, their budget. Um, I can also use them for an actual target or goal. So let's present, pretend that I want them to uh, hit some sort of target on uh, getting people their flu shot. And the target is 80% of the eligible patients. And then here I can see um, how far are groups from that 80%? Are they over or are they under? So I can also use them uh, for that purpose and the end of the bar tells me what the actual value is. So orthopedics is at about 70 something and they need to get, <coughs> excuse me, to 80 um, and pediatrics is at 90% and they're doing clearly better than where we wanted them to be. And these can get flipped the other way and they can also be used for time cuts. Um, so we have a target of 80% on some metric. How have we done over different points in time? Deviation bar charts, fantastic. We can also use bars in combination with some color or for example, a point or a line. Um, often we wanna show a range of values and where your performance is on that, or we wanna show a confidence interval and we wanna show the lower and upper confidence limits. One of the ways that we might do that is by creating these floating bar graphs. So I can show the low value, the high value for some measure, and I can show the performance on that measure for a specific group. Um, and now I can see how wide the ranges are on each and where I have landed. Um, Stephen Few, another data viz guru, um, created the bullet graph. And what he uh, did was uh, 
add even more information in here. In the background, we're able to use a shaded uh, bar chart to show, for example, uh, our national percentiles on some measure like breast can cancer screening. Um, and then we can show for example, maybe our group's uh, clinic's performance on that breast cancer screening. And maybe we use a line to show our target, where did we want to be, or you know, some other number. But you can pack a lot in. And these are simply bars, colors, points, and lines, four sh shapes, alone or in combination. It's all in sort of knowing how to put them all together. Um, I also said that, you know, sometimes you have a wide range of values, but you still need to use that zero in your bar graphs. One of the things that you can do is create two side-by-side -side charts where you're showing the lower values, right? And you're showing the scale here, and then you're aligning the rest of the chart um, and the larger scale values out here. So that's another technique. Or you could use those deviation graphs just to show here's you know where uh, where the number is and are we up or down. But if you need to show the small values and the large values, this is a terrific uh, technique. Again, using uh, colors, lines, points, um, and bars, which we're talking about here, um, you can do things like show uh, the vital few. So Vilfredo Pareto, the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of your results is often found in 20% of your data. But how do I capture that and get people to pay attention to where the opportunity is? So let's pretend this is repeat lab samples. Um, so we know that these, um, five uh, reasons represent 80% of our opportunity. We're showing you the root cause of, we're showing you the cause of the repeats by the different categories. So we're showing you exact numbers here. Um, and then cumulatively, we're saying 28% of the results are here. If we add in clotted specimen, we're at 55 on up, on up. And we put this line on and we show the cumulative values as an added piece of information. So it's these five and they represent 80% of your opportunity. Here's everything else and what they add cumulatively. So Pareto charts, bars, points, lines, color, good labels, good arrangement, um, and you've conveyed a lot of information and you've grabbed people's attention to say, why are those bars green and everything else is gray? So bars are not boring, only the unimaginative use of them is. Um, if I had a dollar for every time somebody told me bars are boring, I would probably um, be on an island someplace, very, very wealthy. But the point is bars are not boring. Um, boring. They are the powerhouse. It's all about how you use them and how you use them in combination with other techniques. Um, does anybody have any questions about those bars at this point? Any questions? Before I keep plowing through, because I know I'm throwing a lot at you. <laughs> okay, I think we can continue. Okay, cool. All right, so the next shape are lines. Um, and clearly we can use lines uh, in lots of different ways. So one thing to remember is that unlike bars, line scales don't have to start at zero. Sometimes people get confused by that. And the reason why is because you're not showing how big something is compared to something else. You're showing how something has changed over time. What's really important though, is to think about your scale and your access because you don't want flat lines and you don't want spiky lines. You want lumpy lines. Um, and so, uh, this is just a reminder to play with that axis to make sure people can see how things are changing over time. Um, and again, you don't want flat, you don't want spiky, you want bumpy lines. Um, also, uh, you want to be careful about how many lines you put on a page because again, they become very hard to see. So you really 
if you can, you don't want to go much beyond, you know, four lines maybe on a bar on a line graph, um, because we get this problem again of having to compare color to the line. And if the values are really close together, they start to clump one on top of each other and you can't really see what's going on. Now you may say, you know, interactively people can hover and see, but again, we have this problem of short-term memory and pre-attentive processing of how much can I hold in my head as I'm trying to make comparisons. But we also have the um, opportunity to use small multiple line charts. So just like our bars, we can create small multiples of line graphs and they work beautifully. Keep your scale the same, use your, you can label your axes once, um, and then in the different categories where you're showing data, you can compare straight across. So you can create um, small multiple line charts as well. Okay, we can use lines as reference values. We can use them on a bar or we could use them on points. So we use lines as references. Um, again, we use lines to show very often a trend in time. Um, however, two additional tips. If you have zero, if you have zero in your data, that's a true value and you should um, plot it, right? If you have a piece of candy and I have no pieces of candy, that's very sad for me. That's a real value, zero. So you need to show that. But if you have no data, and sometimes we just have no data, what you should do is show that as a gap. And pre-attentively, what that does is it says to the viewer, um, there's something, you know, something's missing here. Um, we also know from something called Gestalt principle, Principles uh, theory of continuity. So even though this line ends, our minds tend to see it as continuing. So we know that it continues, but we also have our attention grabbed pre-attentively to say, gap, something's missing here. Um, if you're showing two different types of data, you need to grab attention again to say, hey, something's different. This is my actual data, solid line. Here's the forecast of what we think is going to happen, dotted line. All of these things are rooted in pre-attentive processing. I see what is different. It causes me to stop and say, what's that? Um, and of course, we know that lines are perfectly designed to show uh, change over time. But also, we might want to use them to show, for example, how something has changed in rank. Um, and we could use a couple of um, things, uh, a couple of charts to do that. Um, one might be a slope graph. So um, if we want to show from point one in time to point two in time, how something has changed, and we want to perhaps show how something has changed in rank, we could use a slope graph. So for example, this is health expenditures as a total um, of government expenditures from 1995 to 2013. So all we want to do is show change in direction from one point in time to another, but by using this slope graph, we're also able to see how the ranking may have changed, right? Europe was uh, here in terms of expenditures, and now they're second behind um, the Americas. So slope graphs can show you that as well. Now, if it's important to see how the rank has changed uh, more frequently, so for example, you know, every three years, what is the change in cancers with the highest five-year survival rate? So are we making progress on survival rates by cancer type? Um, we can use what's called a bump chart. And essentially all you're doing is you're saying, what was the ranking in 1977 for prostate cancer um, versus everything else for survival rate, very low. And then how has that changed over time? But what has it bumped out of that position? out of that ranking. So you're seeing how prostate cancer survival rates have bumped um, their place in the ranking compared to breast cancer, skin cancer, thyroid cancer. And now um, at the end point, it's number one. So these are lines, but it's just a technique called a bump chart. 
Edward Tufte uh, created spark lines. You may be very familiar with these. In healthcare, for example, we might use them to monitor a patient's vital signs um, compared to the normal range. So, you know, these are just little sparks of data. He calls them data words or design simple word size graphics. Um, so we've used our label once here. We're using the line to show, you know, how the um, vital signs are, are uh, what the record of them is over time. And we're using just a a shaded gray uh, bar in the background to show your lower confidence limit and your upper um, normal range. And so you can see when something goes out of range and they're just lined up one right after another So and they continually go. The mistake I often see people do is use these and think that they can stand alone with no labels, um, nothing contextual. And if you think about how Tufty design, talks about them, he says they're data words. They're really not meant to stand alone. They've got to have something around them that helps you understand what's going on with them. Um, and they can off, often look very flat. Um, so just be careful about how you use them, but they're great, um, especially when you need to get a lot of information in a little space and see what's going on over time. We can also use a deviation line graph. It doesn't have to be just a bar. So for example, if I wanna see how our emergency department patient volume has changed year over year, I don't need to know the exact number. I just need to know am I up or down? I can do that um, using a line. Um, and if I wanna see am I over budget or below budget, I can use a line using that gestalt principle of continuity. I still see that these are even though it's a different color, I know this is the same line. A frequency polygon. Maybe I wanna know the salmonella cases by the date of illness, or I wanna know cumulatively, what do those cases look like? All with a line. All right, um, the reason why we put lines on scatter point, point plots um, is to help us see direction um, and correlation. So is there some relationship between our variables on the y and x, x axis or is there none? And if there is a relationship, in which way is it moving? Um, and this is again a gestalt principle and it helps us our eyes anchor um, and see pr proximity and direction about which way these data are moving. They increase as one goes up, the other goes up, or they decrease one variable goes down as the other goes down. And that is why we put lines on scatter plot is to help people visually see, is there a relationship? Are those points converging towards um, near the line and is there a direction to them? So there are reasons why we use these techniques. All right, shape three are our points. Um, and I will go through these very clearly, uh, quickly. Obviously we can use them in scatter uh, plots, um, but one advantage of them is we can also just plot things like nominal values um, instead of using a bar because Again, we're not encoding how big something is by the length of the bar. We're just showing you where on a scale the values land and is something larger or smaller than something else. So if we have limited space or the values are close together, we could use a point instead of a bar um, that we have to start at zero. So we could use a point because we don't have to start the bar, gra the graph at zero. <clears throat> um, Pre-attentively, if we have more than one uh, variable that we're trying to show, we can use what we're calling shape points to say these are two different variables that we are plotting. Um, and this is all pre-attentive, right? If the shapes are different, I see, oh, that's one group versus this group. Um, we can use filled or unfilled color uh, uh, shapes so that we can see what's beneath them, or we can make our shapes transparent so we can see, an, um, instead of them clumping on top of each other, we can see um, the, va the values. Um, and so we can also plot individual values instead of just using a bar chart, we can show the individual values we don't have to start at zero and we can show the distribution. And if these values start to, we go vertically or horizontally. And if these values tend to um, jump 
land on top of each other, we can use a technique called jittering, where we make this a little bit wider, um, a little bit wider, and we're able to jitter or separate those points so that we can see them more clearly. And you'll see here is an example um, that we created for a type of uh, insurance, children's health insurance and Medicaid insurance in the United States, where we show it as a bar chart compared to some average. So how is each state in the United States doing on behavioral health care measures? But then if you click it, it's interactive and you can see where each state lands, what the um, average is, and for a specific state, what their value is. Bars, lines, points, color, techniques like jittering um, and showing distributions. You could also use points when you have line graphs to help anchor people's eyes. I wanna be able to see this point in time compared to this point in time. So the reason to add a point here is to help me to anchor those points in time. I might create a performance quadrant where I'm just plotting things. So for example, I want to know who provides um, the best care to at the lowest cost. But I also know that patients are different. Some patients are high risk, some patients are low risk. And really what I want is for my clinics to deliver care in the high risk, low cost Place. So I can create a simple quadrant where these are my average risk scores, my average per member per month cost, and then I just plot the results of this, and then I label my quadrants. For a bunch of busy executives who are trying to figure out, you know, which clinics maybe need some help improving on their cost effectiveness, um, I'm able to see um, where I want them to move, right? If they're high risk, high cost, I want them to move closer over into this quadrant. Um, if, you know, if they're low risk and high cost, I want them to move over into this quadrant. But very easily with lines and points and a little bit of shading and good labeling, I can see um, all the results for a whole lot of different groups. Um, we can also, of course, overlay points onto things like uh, choropleth maps, which allow us to um, enter lots of data and information. So in the background, we're showing you the population and we're using a point to show you where the health facilities are in relationship to the populations with simple points. Um, the last shape is uh, boxes. Um, and so I just want to show you how we can use boxes. So uh, Tukey, the statistician who was uh, Edward Tufte's mentor, um, created the box and whisker uh, plot, uh, box plot. And even though it looks like a bar or a, 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 a rectangle, he called it a box uh, and he called it a box, so we're calling it a box. <laughs> and essentially what this allows you to do is show a distribution um, by the different quartiles, maybe the average, the median, and it shows uh, you know, the high, low, and the 50 per 50th percentile results here. We can overlay points to help us see things like individual values as well as outliers. We can also use boxes, um, you might call them tables, but they're boxes when we have a lot of data and information and it would really be hard to get them, for example, in a bar graph. And we can use different color um, techniques such as a saturation or um, a different cutoffs, discrete uh, values using different colors. So here we're showing in the United States where we spend our money on what type of care and who the insurance companies are that pay the most for that kind of care. So hospital care, the biggest burden is by private health insurance and here's our scale. But here we wanna show um, our utilization rates in our clinic by a day of the week. Um, and so we've just created these cutoffs of different colors to grab attention. <clears throat> and so we're saying the light blue colors are where um, we're not uh, using our full capacity and the darker colors is where we're using more of our capacity. Um, and so it's just two different techniques. The tree map was created um, to show 
complex hierarchical data that could not be better displayed using a uh, bar chart, but people use them incorrectly all the time and it makes uh, me a little bit crazy. They use them to show just one dimension of data instead of these hierarchies. And so it's important to understand that what is being encoded by um, this tree map. So here's how it works. For example, we're showing all causes of death in North America. These white borders are the different um, countries. Here's the United States, here's Mexico, here's Canada. Then we're able to encode by the size of the boxes, the cause of death um, in each of these places. Then the next thing that gets encoded using color is, are those number of deaths from one point in time, 2003 to 11, increasing or decreasing? Um, and so you see that although heart disease um, is really big in the United States, it's actually been decreasing. And interestingly, dementia has been increasing over time. But these are hierarchies of complex data. These are complex charts to serve that purpose. And so if you're only coding one dimension, you really should stick to a bar chart because you can rank, rank them, people can see them easily and people understand um, how to decipher them. If you don't know how to decipher these, they can be um, just very confusing. So these are complex um, chart types of boxes for uh, hierarchies of data and advanced audiences. Okay, we'll talk about maps a little bit. And this is my Dartmouth Atlas map. Um, so these are choropleth maps and that's just where you use a, um, saturations of color to say the rate of something or the number of something is higher in one place and lower in another. Intuitive, easy to see, pretty easy to understand. Um, but you have to really choose your metrics carefully. So let's pretend in the state of Colorado, we're interested in the birth rate for teenagers age 15 to 19. Um, and so it's fair and correct to say, what are the rates per 1000 population? Um, and so here we're seeing this looks very high per 1000 and we're able to make comparisons between these counties. However, if we wanted to know where are the most uh, young girls having um, between 15 and 19 having uh, babies in Colorado, um, we might want to show a count um, because it may be that we really need to get to these girls for some reason. Um, so you have to just choose the metric carefully and think about what it is that you're comparing. Um, very briefly, it's the same idea. My colleague, Lindsay Betzenzal created this COVID-19 for the state of Pennsylvania where she lives. Um, and she, this is interactive and you can see where you can pick cases or case rate per 1,000, um, 100,000, excuse me. So these tell very sort of different stories. So it's really important to think about who's the audience, what is it you want them to see and how do you want them to see it when you use a map. Um, core plus maps can also just have threshold shading. And so you just want to say, for example, where are the people in the United States um, more than 10% of uh, where, which states have more than 10% of their population have no health insurance. And so you simply use one color to say, these are the places where the most uninsured Americans live. Um, you could also use a, a technique called hex tile map. These are more abstract and they serve a couple purposes. One is um, sometimes because like Texas and Alaska and the United States are so big, we call it the Alaska effect. So even though their numbers might not be very big, their geographic mass is so big that they look like their numbers are really big. So this can be one way to avoid that. Um, and you can show, for example, percent uninsured and every state gets the same amount of space here. Um, they're also pretty good if you want to use them as navigation, right? Um, 
Don't use a map just for navigation, but, oh, I see that Texas has a high uninsurance rate. This could be interactive. Click, take you to something else. And again, you could just use these as a threshold map. Um, who in the United States has expanded the Medicaid program versus who has not? So one color versus the other. These are hex tile maps. You just have to decide whether this is something that you need to use or is a good choice for you. Because I don't really get a sense of geography here, but I'm also not distracted by the fact that one state is bigger or smaller than the other. Um, the symbol dot density maps, you'll remember these from the top of the hour. This is Jon Snow and where he simply is marking on a map the geographic location of something that happened. Um, and of course, we can do proportional symbol maps like I showed you previously where we're putting a point on top of a map. One of the challenges, though, is you can use them, but it's kind of hard to compare this key to the size of the, the point that I'm using. So it might be that you use a choroplath map to show how many numbers of hospitals per 100,000 people do we have in uh, New Jersey. This is New Jersey. Um, and sometimes you just shouldn't use a map at all, right? Really what you need to know is, um, you know, Yes, I'm seeing the percent uninsured uh, in 2017 versus 18, but what I really want to do is I want to be able to rank and I want to be able to compare uh, and I want to put in some comparison benchmark with a line. Sometimes you don't need a map, you just need a bar graph and people love maps, but my advice is be very careful about why you're using a map. Make sure it makes sense. All right. Um, I want to show you something that is included in the book, but also talk about a few things like the charts that we say never use, use with caution and best practice and why. So we are in the no pie and donut zone um, in our consultancy and in the way that we create uh, visualizations. And there's a reason why. It's not because we're pie and donut haters, um, but there are real reasons why something else can work better. So um, very quickly, again, I have the problem of a key. I have to match and hold in my, in my head you know, what these are showing me. Um, I can't rank these. I can't put in a comparison. Um, I can't put anything else with this. So I can't have a bar graph followed by a line graph that shows me something over time. Um, so they're just not efficient. Um, and this is simply a pie with no middle, right? That's all that a donut graph is. The, the mantra on our team and for many of us in the viz world is that anything that you can do with a pie or a donut, you can do better with a bar, just full stop. Um, and we give you the reasons why when people start to ask for these things, um, we try to give you tips and tricks about why they don't work and and what you can do that works better. Um, so we stay away from these 100%. Now, people say to me, would you ever use them? Well, maybe if I was teaching a kid fractions or maybe um, if I had just a couple of values on something like an infographic, but for the really sophisticated data visualizations, you won't ever really see these. People just know that if you use those other four shapes in some compelling and interesting way, you're gonna get a much bigger bang for your buck. Sometimes we will say, well, we wanna show that everything adds up to 100%. You can do a Google search um, and you'll find, you know, funny charts that don't add up to 100% all over the place. Just because it's a pie graph doesn't mean the underlying data adds up to 100%. The software will let you graph anything. Additionally, um, it would let you make a bar graph that where the values that are part to hold don't add up to 100%. If you want to reassure people, you know, put it in your label. But additionally, uh, you know, what we find is that people don't want to know that the data adds up to 100%. They want to know the distribution, the ranking, the comparison. And so um, it's really a myth about this 100% um, is the reason why you use a pie chart. 
Um, I already shared with you the trouble um, and the challenges with these multiples of several parts uh, stacked bar charts, the MCPSBCs. Um, and again, we have to match our, our key here. Um, it's very hard, if not impossible, to see some of these smaller values. They all begin and end at a different place on the scale. What I want to show you about this small multiples bar chart is another technique. I already showed you just the bar graphs, but another technique is that you can show within each of the bar in the small multiple what percentage or proportion of 100% these values um, equal. So this is clinical trial enrollment, right? So, um, you know, completed, we're recruiting, et cetera, et cetera. So you can make um, these uh, part of the whole within the small multiple, but stay away from these. These are almost impossible to understand. Um, and you can use um, this. And also you're going to find that these little tiny values, you know, they really don't give you a whole lot of information. Sometimes you can collapse them into one group. And then if somebody really wants to know, you give them a supplemental graph that shows what makes up those parts. Um, the bubble. <clears throat> Steer clear of packed bubbles. Here's the problem. Um, as humans, we have a very hard time. We can't tell how big the diameter of this bubble is compared to that bubble. You'll see I can't label them. They start to sort of get really tiny. Um, so these are not great. People like them, but they really are not powerful in terms of telling me what's really going on in this data. Um, so stick to things like your bar graphs. And this is a table lens, which is just another kind of uh, small multiple where you're just pulling out the, the variables of interest. So, you know, what is the vaccine coverage? How big is the population? And what is the GDP of each country? And then I can click and I can sort everything on these um, different columns. Sometimes you might use these size bubble scatter plots. They can be helpful to show you where something lands on a scale and how big it is. But again, we have this circumstance of comparing this um, key to this. And here I can give you all of those values. I can use my label once. I can read across. I can sort them. So these are not, not never use, um, but these can be much better. These are pretty much, don't use these. They're just impossible to see what's going on. Um, people like Sankey diagrams and Sankey diagrams were originally created really to show the flow of something, but we see people struggling to show relationships. So, you know, mental health disorders with comorbidities. Well, it's not a flow from behavioral health to something else. And then you get all of these um, lines that are just impossible to see. So this is not the right use of a flow diagram, Sankey diagram, that shows how um, something is moving from one place to another. Um, you might use a relationship matrix here um, because you've got a lot of data points instead of a scatter plot, and you're just using color to say, where I see um, developmental um, challenges, am I also seeing behavioral challenges? Or schizophrenia, we often see you know, neurotic um, diagnoses, et cetera. So these are very quick and easy ways using colors and boxes to show the strength of um, relationships. You can use a Sankey, for example, if you want to know where are patients going from the hospital to which types of doctor, doctor A, B, and C. And this is the correct use of a Sankey, right? I can see Hospital 5 sends doctors to um, patients to this doctor and this doctor and probably the most over to C. So it gives me some idea of movement and flow. But we could also use a heat map diagram for the same thing, right? I can see where I'm sending my patients. And then on these boxes, I can add a marginal histogram. So I'm showing you the percentage and I'm showing you the distribution of the count. So this is the total for the row and the a column and the total for the row. So by adding on things, we create these more in-depth charts um, so that we can see more. Colored boxes, bars. That's it. 
steer clear of 3D. There are actual studies. Why do people use 3D? And there's a couple, a couple things that come out of the research. One, um, it may be that if people think their data is not reliable, they have bad data. Um, they think if they obfuscate it with 3D that people won't notice, or they just think that it looks cool. But in actual fact, um, just steer clear. No 3D, it's hard to see, it's hard to make comparisons. Just show 2D, that's all you need. Okay, so I um, am gonna really plow through and tell you uh, how do we bring this all together? So I showed you chart types, etc. So we talk about dashboards, reports, tables and lists, multi-dimensional exploratory displays, that's a term we coined trying to describe what these things are, infographics and info posters. And we really say definitions matter. Uh, other people will argue eh, anything's a dashboard or the software calls everything a dashboard. But here's why we really dig in about this. Um, you know, if you remember Alice in Wonderland and the Cheshire Cat, she says to Alice, what road do I take? And he says, well, where are you going? And she says, I don't know. And he says, then it doesn't matter. If you don't know where you're going, any road is going to get you there. It's the same thing. If you haven't grounded yourself in the definitions of what it is that you're creating, then any word about whatever it is that you're creating will get you there. Um, and so we really believe that definitions matter. So um, a dashboard is defined as a monitoring tool, one page, key metrics, think about your car dashboard, right? You don't get into your car, push a hundred buttons or look in the back seat for what's going on. It immediately tells you, you have gas, you're going too fast, wear your seatbelt, whatever it may be. Um, so a, a dashboard, in our world is that it's key monitoring metrics that you need to do your work. If you're a hospital CEO, you should be able to open this up and you see one screen that tells you, how are you doing on your budget this month? How are you doing over time? Where are you over or under? What are your quality metrics? These are bullet graphs. How are you doing? Are people uh, on or off budget with their electronic health records compliant? Um, and then we can do things like show your mortality OE ratio. So what did I observe versus what did I expect? Um, we're showing the confidence intervals, but we're only using color in the red points to say, hey, hospital CEO, this is where you're seeing more deaths than you would have expected. Um, now you should go talk to your chief medical officer. All of the things that this person is responsible for needs to do their work right in front of their eyeballs. If you work in a public health department, for example, um, you want to do syndromic surveillance for things like influenza. And so here we're just saying how many, you know, in 10 weeks, how many cases of respiratory illness in influenza have you had? How has that changed from the prior week? And we're just using red points to say, hey, look here, this is New York City data. You've got a problem. Um, and this was early in 2020. Here, we're just showing it trending over time. We're using a black and white choropleth map to say where are the highest counts of this influenza type disease. We're using these colored bars and different saturations um, to say in what age group are we seeing the most of these folks getting sick and how has that trended over time? This is a dashboard, everything you need to keep your community, to be aware of what's going on in your community and to be alerted that something may be going uh, south that you need to pay attention to. Dashboard, simple, but also complex in terms of density of data. Um, I'm going to spend less time on this report, but a report is gives you more contextual information, right? This isn't specifically calling out, hey, you've got a problem. It's saying, here's some differences in your data for patients who get readmitted to the hospital. But you'll also note not a lot of filters on these, right? It's just like your car dashboard. You don't punch a bunch of 
buttons to get the data. It shows up when you open it. But here we've got more interactivity. I can look at different types of diagnoses and everything changes. There's a lot of interactivity in here to show me what diagnoses are people getting when they get readmitted. You know, um, are we up or down compared to what we expected? When are people coming back into the hospital? So these are more uh, contextual information about something like a readmission rate. Now to answer the very specific question about what do you do with big data and lots of things that people need to explore, this is um, one that we uh, finished a little while ago for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and it's called EpiQuery. And we call these multi-dimensional multi exploratory displays of data. And what you have to think about here is, and we spent a ton of time, and I haven't talked about it on this call, but it's about requirements gathering and who's going to be using these things. And oftentimes when you have lots and lots and lots of data and you want to see it through different prisms or views, you're going to have novices and you're going to have very experienced people. And so you've got to think about ways to get to all of those folks. Um, I encourage you, and I've included these slides I think are going to be made available to go out and play around with this and you'll see uh, interactively what I mean. But for example, um, we show using a heat map table exactly what indicators or what data is in the New York City database about uh, people's health uh, in the city. And they have a ton, but this very quickly lets me see the year and the indicators and how much data there is. As I move through, now I can say, well, I want to know something about uh, smoking in the city and how, who are these people and are they increasing or decreasing smoking? And so here you get a little bit more interactivity, but you learn something about the demographics and the trends of that indicator. Um, and then you say, well, I want to know something by neighborhood. Interactively, um, you could select uh, you could select to see it by a map. This is why it's much more user driven um, and it, it's exploratory. Or um, I know it's tiny, but here I could say, well, I don't wanna see a map. I wanna see a bar graph. I don't wanna see a bar graph. I wanna see a table. I don't wanna see a table. I wanna see it by a trend over time. So it gives you a lot more opportunity to play around with this, but Everything is designed to only display it using the best practices, but it's very simple and it takes really huge amounts of data that's highly complex and it just lines it up in a way that lets me explore it. Um, as I get more sophisticated, I can do things um, like analyze by demographics. And again, I have the opportunity to show it in different ways. Now, I also have to serve the people who are statisticians or who work in the department. And so they wanna compare two indicators. They wanna say, tell me something about people who are depressed and are uh, binge drinkers. And so you can see the intersection of two variables. And now we've just made it so that when you select those two uh, variables, we're plotting those uh, variables together, again, just using bars, lines, points. Um, and you have the ability to on the fly switch all of these things out. And then for the really, really sophisticated user, and this is all in one um, thing, and if I have time, I'm happy to go to it and show it to you. I have it pulled up on my internet. Um, I wanna test to statistical significance. So I wanna know, is binge drinking really different in Manhattan than it is in Queens? I can select those two variables and it will on the fly do a statistical significance test and it will return a result to say, yeah, there's something different between these, um, the drinking habits in these two communities or no, there's really nothing here like a real uh, difference. It's not statistically significant. And you can do different types of things with these. But these are some of the ways that you get at really complex data. Now, all of those you know, a dashboard, a report, all of those also are complex data. But if you're looking for a tool that helps people to just explore and is driven 
These tools are driven more by what is the user's questions, right? Versus a dashboard is what is the work you do that you need to support or a report that lets you explore it um, with specific indicators is, okay, we saw your readmission rate was high. Now let's explore that. It's very much more curated around scope, role, the decision you need to make. This says, have at it. Um, we're gonna create tools that let you poke around in here, but we're gonna make sure that you can't create crazy graphs. You know, we're gonna um, make sure that, you know, we're using all the best practices and we're gonna make this highly accessible to you. Um, so those are multi-dimensional exploratory displays. Um, two things, and then I'll take some questions. Um, infographics are different than all of the above. They start with a point of view. They have the outcome in mind. Raise awareness, teach, persuade. You get curated data that supports that point of view, and then you put it into a uh, information piece with graphics, but you're not exploring, you're not supporting somebody's work, you have a point of view, like vaccinations are important, here's why you should get them. Infographics are different from info posters, places like the CDC, World Health Organizations call these infographics, they are not, these are simply informational posters, they're not using facts and figures and statistics about anything, whereas here we're incorporating in all of those things and using um, different techniques to show you the data and information. Um, okay, so I told you at the start, Data viz is not intuitive. It has to be learned through study and deliberate practice. And I say deliberative practice because it's not just doing the same thing over and over again, right? It's reaching out to the experts. It's seeing what's out there. It's reading the books. It's understanding the research. And it's really being critical of yourself um, to understand what works and what doesn't work and to get better at it all the time through practice, 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 and coaching, coaching, coaching. Thank you.